that is cooled by the fuel, uh, the flow of fuel gets decreased and the heat input uh, gets decreased, but not quite as rapidly. So they had trouble uh, throttling it over uh, an appropriate range and still uh, keep it cooled properly. Just days after the X-15's construction began, Russia launched the first man-made satellite, Sputnik 1. It was a blow to American pride and to the X-15 philosophy of flying to space and back under pilot control. And there were delays with the XLR-99 engine. We found out early on that we weren't going to have an engine ready when the airplane was ready to go into flight test. There was a proposal to put LR-11 engines, two clusters of four barrels in the X-15, and I objected strenuously based on previous experience that when you go with an interim engine, you very often never see the main one. The X-15 was throwing up many new challenges. The pressure suit the pilots would wear had not only to work inside the cockpit, if the pilot had to eject, the suit would need to withstand extremely high speeds in the atmosphere. The suit was tested on a rocket sled at speeds up to a thousand miles an hour. People made uh, a problem of the safety and the escape capability. That became a major problem in the development of the airplane. Some people wanted to put capsules in it, which the airplane we, we never would have accomplished. In fact, most of the capsules we've ever made are just to, used as a way to commit suicide to keep from getting killed, in my way of thinking. You know. I offered to fly the X-15 sitting on a tomato can if they'd just give me the money we'd pay for an escape system. <laughs> In the end, the designer settled for a straightforward ejection system. When the parachute opened, the pilot was pulled free of the seat assembly. Flying the X-15 would be an enormous physical challenge to the pilot, well before the X-15s were completed, Scott Crossfield and the two other initial pilots, Joe Walker of NACA and Bob White of the Air Force, spent many hours in the centrifuge. I probably have as much centrifuge time and pressure suit experimental time and pressure chamber time and all of that as any man alive. And all of it really was to learn what, what we should know but it never was done as it is now in a very formal academic way as it is for astronauts and pilots and all of that. And frankly, if you had a medical problem in those days, you just kept it to yourself. You, you, uh, we became pretty expert at that. <laughs> By today's standards, the first X-15 simulator was crude. It wasn't designed to give any physical sensation of flight. Its purpose was to display accurate instrument responses to control inputs, which was valuable training in a mission on which the pilot would rarely get a chance to take his eyes off the panel. I believe very strongly in a simulator at that stage to learn procedures and to learn systems and had a lot of disagreement with people who said I should practice in the simulator a couple, three hours before every flight. I didn't want to do that because we really didn't know what the X-15's characteristics were and I didn't want to learn a lot of bad habits. I would rather be confronted with it as an airplane rather than have to put aside things that I had uh, learned as uh, the dynamics of flight is what I didn't want to learn from a simulator. There was another form of simulator available to the first X-15 pilots. If the Lockheed F-104 was configured properly, using flaps and extended landing gear to increase drag, landing approaches roughly similar to those predicted for the X-15 could be flown. The opportunity was offered to Scott Crossfield. And I'd never flown an F-104 before, and the guys at Edwards who run the F-104 flight program thought I was crazy. Well, I was. I wasn't about to let anybody get the door open on getting into my, <laughs> into my cockpit on the X-15. And now I have the privilege of pressing the button, which will bring out the question. 
When X-15 No. 1 rolled out on October 15, 1958, Vice President Nixon called it the vehicle that regained America's lead in space. But the big XLR-99 engine was a year behind schedule, and the X-15 still had everything to prove. Although the X-15 had still not flown, the U.S. Air Force already had approval for the next phase of the piloted conquest of space. The X-20, known as the Dinosaur, would be launched into orbit by rocket and then fly back to Earth under full pilot control. It would combine the best features of the X-15's piloted approach with the speed and altitude capability of pure rocket programs like Mercury. In the summer of 1958, Congress had passed the Space Act, and just two weeks before the rollout of the first X-15, the old National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, NACA, had been replaced by a new body, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. NASA's primary objective was to put a man into space, and all space programs apart from the X-20 were placed under its control. The X-20 still belonged to the Air Force. Edwards Air Force Base was now the home of the X-15. Its test program would be carried out from the same dry lake area that had seen the testing of the first American jet and the success of the first plane to break the sound barrier. The buildings that formed the base for the X-15 program still stand at Edwards, just to the north of the main base. The bunkers in which engineers and crew sheltered during static engine tests are still there, and so are the rigs in which the X-15 was secured. Because of the delay with the XLR-99, the first X-15 was fitted with two XLR-11 engines, the same engine that had taken Chuck Yeager and the X-1 through the sound barrier more than 10 years before. The flight test program began officially on March 19, 1959, but there were delays and morale suffered. On June 8th, Scott Crossfield took off under the wing of the B-52 to try another glide flight. We flew the airplane without any propellants on board just to get its handling characteristics. In fact, it's kind of interesting. My checkout flight was 3 minutes and 58 seconds. And therein was where I had to learn all I had to know to land the airplane for the first time. Release. It's a clean break. Looks pretty good here. I'm at 36,000. The X-15 had a sidearm controller, a small control stick on the right of the cockpit. No one knew it wasn't set up properly. The sidearm control was designed so that you could virtually immobilize your arm just by pressing down on the armrest and just move your hand in that direction and roll your arm in that direction. So you didn't get all of this spring and mass system into the control motion. Scott, don't forget the vertical. Okay, we might clear the edge of the lake here. Crossfield could have elected to use the joystick, but he saw no problem in deciding to try out the sidearm controller. Everything was on the numbers as I had planned it, and I asked for the nose to pitch up to flare and got into what appeared to me to be a classic static instability. Crossfield was enormously experienced. He knew he was in deep trouble. It kept pitching up. I started it down. It kept pitching down and I got into an oscillation that was pretty wide excursion and angle of attack. I'd intended to land at around 175 knots, but it wasn't until I was down about 145 knots that I got this airplane corralled so that I could get the skids on the ground at the bottom of that oscillation, or else it would, we would have bought the farm and rolled it up in the ball. About 30 feet. I just hold her steady and you'll settle right there. I have a trophy at home that is literally a brick ground into a streamlined shape, beautifully mounted on a plaque 
given to me by the Southern California Soaring Society.